Let's get the show on the road. Uh, so yesterday, uh, we heard from Les Valiant about uh, kinds of reductions that do nothing. And now, and now this morning, we've got two people who are going to spin doing nothing out for a whole 90 minutes. <laughs> That'll be quite a challenge. And I'll be coming down like a, like a hammer on repetition, deviation, and the other one that I've forgotten just at the moment. This is just for the Brits in the audience. So. Anyway, right, let's, let's get on. Uh, first up is uh, Ginny Tsai, uh, Wisconsin Madison, about uh, holographic algorithms with match gates. Okay, so uh, thanks. I suppose this is a talk about nothing, so we have to <laughs> end right there. <laughs> um, so there are three frameworks that I'd like to address the counting problems. Uh, graph homomorphism, we heard quite a lot from uh, Professor Leslie Goldberg's talk yesterday. Um, constraint satisfactions, um, Holland problems. And uh, there has been quite a bit of uh, progress in the classification program, and we'll try to address each of them a little bit, but then my focus is going to be on, again, do nothing <laughs> reductions. Um, so uh, in this paper, uh, graph homomorphism was defined, and uh, there's the classic uh, reference center book, and uh, also they proved the decision dichotomy. You already heard about this from Leslie's talk yesterday. Um, but I would like to uh, move directly into the, uh, the counting version, so I will define it in terms of the partition functions, especially uh, those of you who are also in this program from statistical physics who will find it very uh, familiar. So you have a matrix, and I like to start already from the complex field, and I'll say a few words about this sort of uh, my view why this should be the right view, the uh, right field on which we discuss this. Uh, so you're given the matrix, uh, and then uh, uh, given an input graph, you consider all vertex assignments, and then uh, these are, think of this Q different colors, and for every edge of the input graph, uh, they give you an entry of the matrix, and then you multiply them. Okay. You've already seen examples of this. If you have a two by two matrix, that's uh, 0, 1, 1, 1, that's vertex cover, uh, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0 will be independent set. Uh, the uh, 0 is not a diagonal. 1 is off diagonal will be uh, coloring and so on. So the, the, these will represent various uh, uh, combinatorial problems. And this quantity in the 0, 1 case will be 0, 1 if it's a valid uh, solution to the problem. And then sum over will become the number of solutions. And uh, um, so they represent all sorts of interesting problems. Here, here's a, a somewhat less obvious problem. It's a 1, 1, 1, minus 1. Okay? So think of this as coming in 0, 1, 0, 1. And this function, this is a binary function sitting on the edge. And it looks at the two vertices on the either ends, and it's for 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, then it's 1. And if it's uh, 1, 1, then it gives you a factor minus one. So if you think about for a minute, you see that I'm talking about, let's say, you focus on the set of vertices that are assigned one, and then you're only looking for edges that are between them. Those, only those edges matter. The edges hanging off don't matter. Okay? They are product together. Become one. So it becomes a minus one to the power, which is a number of edges in the selected subset. That's induced subgraph being odd or even. That's the issue. So in fact, it will be the number of even induced subgraphs minus the number of odd induced subgraphs. And in this case, it's, it's a little bit like a determinant where you have this sort of an even odd and you have a difference. Except here, the permanent is so solvable easily because the sum of all even or odd is to be or not to be. Of course, every induced subgraph is one of those. So therefore, the total number is 2 to the n, and the induced, total number of induced subgraphs. And therefore, the sum is easily computable. And then if you take this arithmetic difference, you'll find the number of all the induced subgraphs, for example. So th these quantities have some meaning, and this turns out to be uh, something that can be computed in polynomial time, even though the definitional thing talks about 2 to the n terms. OK, so then uh, you know, uh, the work of uh, Dyer and Greenhill got the balls rolling, where 
they uh, look for zero one matrices and define a graph homomorphism for the partition function. And the question becomes, for what kind of A, it defines a problem. The problem is input G, compute that. Okay, And they have a dichotomy theorem. And this has been extended uh, by Bulatov Gro to the non-negative by uh, uh, Goldberg, Jerem, Gro, and Thurley uh, to the real, uh, and then to the complex. And um, I would like to emphasize that when it goes from the non-negative to plus or minus, or at least cancellation, uh, and finally, of course, to the complex, where cancellations happen is potentially where interesting computation happens in some sense. And, and this is an example. Oh, boy, I don't know this. This is an example. So when there are some intricate polynomial time algorithms, then the classification becomes harder. Because if you believe P is not equal to sharp P, then what we are really basically saying is that uh, uh, even though we don't see any other algorithms for this problem, there is none. And uh, since there are perhaps hidden ones, then this becomes harder a task. And this is, in fact, for example, perhaps one of the difficulties trying to reach the decision CSP dichotomy. Then maybe there are some hidden polynomial time algorithms. Right? OK, so now let me define CSP, uh, counting CSP. You have a set of uh, uh, constraint functions. So earlier, you can think of uh, there's a single constraint function, which is binary, sitting on the edge. And now I'm having this sort of a total. Sorry, could you go back just for a yeah. second? So let's say we have two by two matrices. Right. Do you have, have you classified which are which? Oh, yeah, this is for every Q. Q can be. No, no, but you say given A, whether it's in P or sharp P can be decided in polynomial time. Oh, yeah, yeah. This, this in fact, is a much more explicit than saying it's in polynomial time. So how, how far have you gone? Uh, Everything, really. Uh, th th this statement by saying it's polynomial time is a little uh, very weak statement of the truth, that we have almost a closed form expression of it. So if I hand you a 5 oh, yeah. by 5 yeah. matrix, yeah. you could it's there. Okay. That's the whole point of dichotomy theorem, right? But of course, you immediately see that this goal is not quite reached by the next dichotomy theorem. OK, so this is, yeah, this is, in some sense, we sort of understood what makes OK, so maybe just say it, what it is. It's going to be a direct sum, if you properly, suitably order the uh, colors of, of the coloring of 1 to Q. And then uh, each of the block will be either bipartite or not. And if it's bipartite, uh, each block will be as described below. And so now I'm talking about either the block of the bipartite part or the individual part. And they are then some sort of a rank one modification of a suitable tensor product of, of, of some Fourier transform matrices or something. And then they are, actually, this is not quite right. There are some quadratic uh, form requirements on the vertexes which had to come up in this classification. So that's roughly it is. OK, so if you think about this particular one and imagine it's a you know, 41 by 41 uh, Fourier matrix, 41 is a prime, I think. Okay. So, okay. so, and then you can do uh, tensor products of these guys. And then you do some rank one modification. That becomes one block. And then you can have any, any number of blocks of this sort. That's roughly what it is. And now, uh, CSP. I give you a set of constraint functions. Uh, each one of them has a certain arity. So this function takes five input, and that function, the other function, takes a 15 input. And they come out with a complex number. And uh, the CSP instance defined by this set of functions, so this is considered constant now, 59,000 functions, that's a, that's a constant. And once this is fixed, it defines a CSP problem, which has input of n variables taking values over some domain and some finite sequence of instantiations of these functions. So f1 applies to x1, x2, x7. f1, again, applies to x1, x1, x9. And then f2 applies to x7, x9, x1, and so on and so forth. Okay? And then you think about, for each assignment of the variable, you multiply these constraint functions, just like what we just did earlier, and you sum over all possible assignments. So 
one way to think about this is like you have a bipartite graph where variables are sitting on the one side, constraints sitting on the other, and then every constraint function applies to a set of a sequence of variables because the order matter. And then you think about all possible assignments of the variables. For each one of the assignments, you multiply these constraint functions, and then you sum over all the product. Is it sum of product computation? So the general form. And then uh, I want to uh, bring to your attention the uh, really breakthrough work by Bulatov and then uh, further by Dyer and Richard B. And there's a long sequence of work. Uh, eventually says that for any complex valued uh, finite set of constraint functions of any finite domain, uh, this problem is either uh, in polynomial time or uh, Shapiard. Okay, so that's, that's the theorem. But uh, uh, at this point, uh, it is still not known the decided the, the 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 which way. If I gave you fifty nine thousand functions, which type it went to is still unknown to be decidable. What is known, the strongest, is for the uh, function where they all take non negative values. But uh, as I mentioned, the non negative ones versus cancellations do matter. And now uh, I'd like to sort of uh, segue into something that we know a little bit more explicitly about the dichotomy. And then I'd like to go to the holographic algorithms for, for this. And so for this, I will focus on the Boolean domain. And for the holographic algorithms and the match gate theory and so on over general domains and something you may want to hear the next talk uh, it will be a wonderful uh, lecture by Sutan Chen. I'm very much looking forward to that. Okay, so here, let me define some uh, function classes. Uh, these are called affine type. Um, you have a constant, it's just a weight. You have an indicator function over an affine subspace over Z mod 2. And then you have I to a quadratic form. Okay, so this is, uh, now the quadratic form, since it's on the exponent of I, you can take Z mod 4, but I want the cross terms like X1 times X2 to have an even coefficient. So this is the definition. And it's defined this way uh, for a reason, because this falls into the dichotomy. Uh, these are the tractable ones, so to speak. By the way, this 1, 1, 1, minus 1 is one of those things where you can think about this as, uh, as uh, minus 1 to the x times y, two variables. Okay. And this is even because it's i to the 2xy. <laughs> So in some sense, uh, you may say, well, I, I don't care about I. Why do, I, why do I talk about I? Well, what I like to argue in, in several points of this talk is to say that uh, in some sense, they, are the, uh, they, they capture the essence. And you, you, if you really want to understand this stuff, you, you sort of are forced to look into that level. Okay, so he, here is an example of how you, uh, how you would write down uh, symmetric functions of this family. And here's a notation. Uh, if you were at the last talk yesterday, you already were introduced by this. So uh, for example, this function says that if the weight of the input, the number of ones coming in, is 0, then the output is 1. And if the, uh, the number of ones coming in is 1, weight 1, then the output is minus i. Again, you say, oh, all right, I don't care about this i. But what about this? Then you have to care, right? I mean, you know, plus minus and so on. Uh, it turns out that to actually understand this, you would have to write it in terms of the complex tensor power form. In some sense, this is, these are the eigenvalues, so there really shouldn't be any resistance. I mean, we, we have progressed like 200 years from the time of Gauss. The, the, you know, complex numbers shouldn't really scare us, right? I, okay. <laughs> but, 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 yeah, okay, so. All right. Uh, Product type, that's another type where you made up by unary functions, equality functions, disequality functions, some weights on variables, and so on. Okay. So these are. But they, they, they are product over disjoint, uh, not necessarily disjoint set of variables, and they are not necessarily uh, symmetric in the end, so the function can be a little uh, a priori, may not be recognizable. And in fact, the Fibonacci gates that Les talked about the yesterday's talk are those which, under holographic reductions, are transformable to these kinds. Oh. So, uh, so he, he, here is a. How much slides have? Oh, okay, there. 
thing always goes a little faster than I want. Ah, so here's a concrete one over the Boolean. So they are very concrete now. It says that your function set is either in affine or product for the CSP of the Boolean domain. Okay, and the class I just defined for you. And, um, and this talk, uh, my primary focus is going to be if you added uh, valence holographic algorithms, what happens? Okay. And uh, uh, in particular, it will be about the do nothing. There was this term called to do nothing Congress or something. I think we want to some do nothing. This is great it's because it's us who are supposed to do the work, so do nothing is great. Uh, so it's do nothing reduction to the uh, FKT. I'll bring this up. So here, here's a setting. Uh, you have what's called a signature grid. You have a graph, basically. We'll see an example in a minute. And uh, think about every vertex has a function sitting on it. And then you think about the edges as, uh, as variables. And for every edge assignments, you consider at every vertex what its incident edges are and what its val evaluation is, and then you take the value. OK? So here's an example. Perfect matching, right? And here's a particular choice of the red ones as 1, the others are 0. Sitting on every vertex is a function that says, if the number of red is 1, then I like it. And that's a perfect matching, right? Otherwise, I don't. OK? And so every valid assignment of 0 ones on the edges is a perfect matching. And uh, the product, in this case, will give you a 0, 1. If it's a perfect matching, it's 1. Otherwise, 0. And the sum is the number of perfect matches. Natural. Yeah. Where is this word coming from? Is it a name of the person, or is it an abbreviation? <laughs> what is it? Uh, less? <laughs> Mystery. <laughs> Mystery. <laughs> um, right. Um. OK, so FKT uh, stands for Fisher Castellian Temperley. Um, this is an algorithm that can compute the number of perfect matchings over planar graphs. And in fact, can compute the uh, weighted sum of perfect matchings <coughs> over planar graphs. Of course, over non-planar graphs, uh, there's a classical theorem that this is sharp. And for almost 50 years, uh, this sort of stood as the algorithm that turns a generally hard sharp problem to be polynomial over planar. Um, and then Les introduced the uh, match gates and holographic reduction. This extended the reach of FKT. And uh, what I like to talk about is uh, what happens if you think about this as sort of at a, at a class level. Can you proscribe the exact reach of all these things? What can it do? Right? This is the classification program view. Um, so here's a quote from uh, Les that uh, the, the situation with P and NP is not dissimilar. It's a very British way of uh, saying it, not dissimilar to that of other uh, unrelated uh, conjectures. And uh, the possibility of accidental and freak objects cannot be dismissed unless you systematically investigate. And, and in fact, there was a paper by him by the name of Accidental Algorithms, where he gave this really weird algorithm, or at least appears to be weird, uh, that solves a certain restricted uh, SAT counting problem over mod 7. But mod 2 is actually known to be NP-hard. So then, uh, then the question is, are there some freak objects that uh, perhaps solve NP-hard problems? And then uh, I don't know what uh, Professor Karp will think about such an eventuality, if this turns out to be, or what uh, Les will think about, because this is going to collapse Sharpie to P all the way. Um, and what I like to say is that um, at least um, for the type of problems we have, we, we can probably classify them subject to the belief that they are not, and they, they are pretty finely uh, de delineated so that there is uh, no fear at this point. But let me get you acquainted with this do-nothing uh, technique. Okay? I, I really think this uh, bears repeating that uh, people have seen it. I apologize. But uh, you know, I think it, it has to get used to if, if you see it several times. 
So let's think about a constraint function. This is very concrete. Uh, I have four variables coming in, and the value is such that uh, the output would be 3 or 0 or 1 or 0 or 3 if the input has Hamming weight 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Okay? So remember this uh, perfect matching will be 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0. Okay? And here is 3, 0, 1, 0, 3. Uh, this is the notation for this function. And then Holland will be a sum of, uh, of these uh, assignments over edges and product over evaluations. So what is this problem? Well, since there are zeros on the odd weight, so the assignments of the zero ones on the edges better be all even for every vertex. So at every vertex, it has to be zero or two or four. Okay? And if it's a zero or four, then the output is three. And if the number of incident edges assigned one, there are six possibilities, assigned is two, then the output is one. And you want to multiply all these together and then sum over all possible such assignments. So that's, that's the counting problem. Okay. Before anyone thinks this is an artificial problem, I, I want you to hold this thought for a sec. Okay? And let's think about the do nothing transformation. So now let's think about the incidence graph of this graph, where on the one side is a bipartite graph. Now the, on the one side is the set of edges of the graph, and on the right side is the set of vertices of the graph, and there is an, a connection between the vertex and edge if the uh, vertex is incident to the edge. This is called the in graph vertex edge incident graph. Okay? And now uh, it's clear that the Holland problem can be viewed as a bipartite version where equalities on the edge is uh, given as a function and the original uh, function on the right vertex is sitting there. Because originally the edge is supposed to be chosen or not chosen and now I'm sort of artificially saying that uh, Originally, there was an edge between the vertex, and then now I made an edge as a bipartite graph version, and ostensibly, I'm allowing 0, 1, 0, 1 assigning on the edges, but I'm insisting that they are the same. Therefore, it's really going back to the same as assigning. I mean, it's just the interpretation of things. However, once you set up this way, then it allows us to a holographic transformation on the left side and right side. And on the... And I'm going to transform by this. And here you see the i appears. And on the left side, I will transform by the z. On the right-hand side, I will transform by the z inverse. And this will give the same value in the end. And now on the left-hand side, you can think about this uh, equality as a truth table of uh, 1, 0, 0, 1. And by 1, 0, 0, 1, I'm merely thinking combinatorially, right? The index is 0, 0 coming in as 1. The index is 1, 1 coming out as 1. Otherwise, the outcome is 0. It's just a truth table written as 2 to the, in this case, 2 variables. And writing as a, a mere, you know, like computer science would do, right? This is, you know, here, here's a truth table. But then I want you to think now in terms of not just as you know, up or downs, as values, as numbers. And you can operate on them with these complex numbers of i. And then once you do that, and this is hocus pocus later, you get this, which is a 0, 1, 1, 0. It transformed into the disequality, which says that I only allow 0, 1, or 1, 0. Right? And this, back into our computer science point of view, or discrete math, there's an obvious interpretation of being an, an orientation of the edge. Okay, so you go this way, you go that way. All right. Now, what about the other side? The other side, you just have to trust me, this dot, 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 I didn't lie to you, but it turns out that it becomes the 0, 1, 0, 0, 1. Okay. So it turns out it's a 0, 0, 1, 0, 0 function. Okay. So the 3, 0, 1, 0, 3 has become 0, 0, 1, 0. This goes through the complex and only through there is it possible to do this. But now think about what is this 0, 0, 1, 0, 0. I'm doing orientation now, going back to the edges. Forget about this vertex. I'm doing edges and doing orientations on the edge. And the constraint on the vertex, the original vertex, is that it has to be exactly weight 2. So 2 coming in, 2 coming out. right? And this is an eminently uh, natural problem. 
It's Eulerian orientation problem. I want to orient the edges so that there are exactly two coming in, two coming out everywhere. And I'm counting this. So the two numbers are exactly the same. This is the do nothing transformation. And in particular, uh, I don't know if it's artificial or not. Because do nothing. Do nothing, exactly. Do nothing, but uh, we get something. It's great. Violating physics, obviously. But who cares? So, so the goal is sort of, I, I don't want to impose some view of what is natural, what is not. I, I want to classify. Okay, so this is uh, the setting. Now, let me bring in this class of what's called the match gate signatures. Uh, so uh, given a graph, a weighted graph, um, you define what's called a perfect matching uh, polynomial or quantity, summing over all perfect matchings, and for every perfect matching edge, you multiply the edge. Okay, so this is the quantity. And then you, uh, for this graph, you ascribe a, what's called a signature, or you can think of it as a tensor, where the index is a subset of the vertices that are outside of this graph fragment. No, I should say this is a planar graph. And then you uh, compute the perfect matching polynomial on the graph where you repeat, you, re you delete a subset. And so if you have five external vertices, then you have two to the five possible values coming out as a tensor in two to the five. And of course, for being perfect matching, there are only at most two to the four non-zero entries. Because okay. So this class is going to be called M. And so now I can state uh, our main theorem that has appeared now uh, with Zhi Guo. Uh, is he here? So for any set of constraint functions on Boolean variables taking complex values, not necessarily symmetric, uh, this uh, CSP problem defined by this set of functions is exactly falling into these three categories. R remember, if it weren't for the uh, planar consideration or holographic reduction to FKT, we only had two. So here it says that's either in polynomial time, regardless any input is a planar or not, or it's a polynomial time on the planar ones, but generally hard over the uh, general graphs, or it is uh, a plan, uh, sharply hard even over planar graphs. Okay, so this is the theorem. And furthermore, uh, the second category where in general it's hard, but over planar graphs is solvable in polynomial time, consists of precisely those problems that are holographically do nothing reducible to the FKT. So this is the, the theorem. Um, so this is like symbolically how this uh, plays out. Uh, Notice that it's not to say that every function in the set of functions in F that are of this type is enough. There are no mixing allowed here, although there are intersections between these classes, but the criteria is precisely that either entirely F is in this or entirely F is in this. Of course, some of them may also be in A, but nevertheless, everything has to be in this or, and so on. Okay, so that's the theorem. Any questions? I should uh, stop. And, uh, please interrupt me. Any, any, any. I'm a little confused. You say you have a trichotomy, but then you say you can have something in two of them. Oh, if you were not to think about planar situation, then then the class two and three got merged. They're just in, over general graph. What happens? And they are all hard. So that was a theorem I already stated earlier. That was due to uh, um, Pn Mingji. Can you remind us of the categorical entropy? So A was This is a product type, the affine type. And this is uh, match gates, but this hat says it's a suitable holographic transformation of the match gates. So the holographic uh, transformation now even enters not only as an algorithmic technique, not only as a, a proof technique, but as a, a part of the statement, the language to state the theorem. Uh, let me, may I ask something? Yes, please, yeah. Please. So that is uh, this, uh, uh, this second point. So if it's a polynomial for planar graphs, it is, uh, and you mentioned uh, often uh, this Castellan theorem. So then uh, uh, there is this uh, for toroidal graphs or graphs of bounded genus. Yeah, by would it uh, somehow so? It would. It would. In fact, uh, I, I I'm sort of saying here's genus zero and. Um, uh, you could extend this to bounded genes, but they usually go on, sort of the genus goes on the exponent time. Yes. 
Um, so is it uh, the disinfect polynomial for any fixed surface for uh, this? Space? Yeah, yeah. So that well, well, I, I, I think so. I, I have, these things have to be very carefully written yeah. down, and uh, yeah. But no, but this theorem does not address that technically, right? It, it just thinks so about, just, yeah. So if it's not planar, then the, you know, technically it goes to the general the case. They carry right. Usually to right. Uh, oh yeah, practices. definitely, definitely. Yeah, you can definitely. And in fact, there are some people who are very interested in these fixed parameter complexity, and I think that would be a very nice open direction to explore here. Well, I should mention that uh, the symmetric versions were already obtained previously. Uh, Ping Yan, Mingji, Tyson. Uh, oh, I think this uh, universality claim uh, should really be greeted with some skepticism because, uh, uh, for for example, uh, this universality is claimed for the match gates and suitable transformations, but. Match gates are uh, naturally Holland problems, okay? And uh, there's a paper by uh, Friedman, Lovas, and Squiver that shows that uh, uh, perfect matching as this partition function sum of over H cannot be expressed as uh, vertex assignments on the partition. So it, it's not. Uh, it's, 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 a, it's a strange situation where the universe that it comes from this Holland primitive in some sense, but we have a theorem that says that uh, over over the Holland framework this is false. So there are in fact additional category two type problems. Okay. And and there the classification is only for symmetric. And so this is another open problem where if you have uh, not necessary symmetric functions. Uh, what happens? Apparently, for well, I think uh, when the constraint functions do not have to be symmetric, they are much more challenging. Okay. So now, for the remaining ten minutes, I like to um, um, give you some flavor of this proof, and obviously, I, I would not be able to give you all of it because it's. Long, but it's it's available on, on online now, so you're welcome to look for the details. Um, so uh, this is a transformation that, if you are familiar with the quantum, uh, you're very comfortable with this. This is the Adama transformation. It's a unitary. It's orthogonal. Okay. And this is the formal definition of this hat. So we had this uh, match gates, and we defined a set of match gate signatures, and then we define this holographic transformation under the Adama transformation of the match gates. And it is a simple um, exercise to show that the CSP is really the special case of the Holland when you throw in all the equalities. And then when you do the do nothing transformation, you get hat on both of them. Okay. So this is only inverse, by the way. Okay. So, uh, so now I bring this in not because it's just sort of dear to my heart. But in fact, the proof of the CSP dichotomy happens in a big way as, as the main arena where the action happens is in the Holland side, or at least equal, equally. Okay. So the claim is that it's either this or this or this or otherwise it's hard, right? Okay, so that's the theorem, right? Um, it turns out that uh, we'll also think about this in terms of the version in, in the Holland side. So this is, think about this like a Fourier transform. I, 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 I have some problems I, uh, for, me to easy to, for me to handle in the primal sense, but then sometimes it's easier for me to handle in the primal, in the dual. Okay, so I, I go over between them. But it's, it's interesting that this is like, a, you know, without the transformation, this is with, but then if you went over, then uh, these will be with and this will be without. But A actually is its own transformation, so it didn't happen, uh, no change. So, so, so these all have just one hat on it. As I said, A is invariant. P hat, on the other hand, is much more difficult to handle than P. So we would rather handle everything concerning P 
on the p side instead of the p hat side. Okay. But uh, on the other hand, m is easier easier to handle than m hat. So we rather handle on the m side. But remember, they are on the opposite side. So there's a tension. So so one you know it's one side says come here, and the other side no 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 go over there. Okay. Um, one necessary condition for match gates is parity. So if 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 you think about uh, uh, a match gate that uh, assigns these values, the value has to be uh, either zero on all Hamming weight even entries or zero on all Hamming weight odd cases. And if a signature, a, a constraint function, doesn't satisfy this, but this remember it was in the transformational side. It was okay. If the transform function of your original set of functions do not satisfy this, then uh, it could not possibly be falling into that type. Although this is all a bit self-serving, you know, we don't have this theorem here. This is, I'm reasoning as if all of this is true. This is a funny way of reasoning about this. But perhaps due to the completeness of this statement, that these kind of self-serving statements are actually very effective. That you, you know you have not gone astray because the statement co covers everything. So therefore, uh, as long as it, it looks OK, then it's OK. You know, if you are clever enough, anyway, you will be able to find a way. OK, so, so, so therefore, it bifurcates at this point into either you satisfy the parity or not. And if it satisfies the parity, then we have some lucky situation where every function that is supposed to satisfy that if the transformed form has all parity, then the original one intersecting the parity ones, the, the product ones, are all already in fi. This is a, I don't know, a, a, a deeper reason for this. This is just a fact. You, know, you have to really understand these functions to, to say this. Okay, I'm saying, you give me any function, if the transform, think about the Fourier transform, uh, satisfies the parity, then this function, if it were already in the product type, then it's already an fi. And so therefore, uh, this possibility in the dual side already implies this. And therefore, I don't have to worry about this. And therefore, I only worry about this, which makes me able to reason only on the dual side. Okay? Because on the dual side is, is the m and this. OK, so this is what I said. If, if it fails, oh, sorry. So, so then there are two cases. One is if it's satisfied or it fails. The first case is if it fails, then there's something that fails. Then we do a arity reduction to produce a unary one that fails. So this is a function that both have non-zero entries of a one variable function that already fails the parity. And then um, quite a bit of work after this to deal with it. Um, One of the idea is that we would like to utilize the symmetric ones. So once we're given something that are neither in A or P, because if it were in A or P entirely, then the thing is already in P, polynomial time. We don't want to prove it's sharpie hard. This is like, right, OK. I'm not insane. Um, so we assume that something is not in A, something is not in P. They may be the same, but may be different. And in this case, we would like to construct something that's symmetric, because we have a symmetric dichotomy. So we're going to apply the symmetric dichotomy on this. Uh, the difficulty with this is, uh, um, generally speaking, it's a bit hard to construct planar ones. But this case, I don't really care that much, because the A and P applies to non-planar. So the second case is that uh, all of the uh, signatures, all the constraints satisfy the parity. OK? Then, of course, if this and this and this, this is already in the dual side, OK? This is already the dual side. Uh, then the problem is in polynomial time. But as I noted, that if it already, the dual side satisfies the parity, then I have the lucky case that I can eliminate one of the cases. OK? So then it, it is talking about this. Okay. So this is what I want to prove. 
This is logically equivalent to the tripartite condition. But in this case, uh, the natural idea is to find a non-affine, non-matched gate symmetric ones that appeal to the dichotomy, and uh, this doesn't work. Um, so uh, what we instead do is trying to get the equality for or the crossover. Once you have the crossover, you can appeal to the non-planar dichotomy. And the crossover is this function, which if you squint closely, you find that this is about uh, some equality. Okay, so it's the first and the third variable are equal. And once you have that, then it's like effectively allowed you to disregard planarity. So once we have the equality, however, we can get this class called the, the planar CSP2. These are a special cases of, of CSP problems where every variable appears an even number of times. And so once you get in the dual side, you get the, the equality 4, then you get equalities of all even arity, then you get the CSP2. But then it comes a sort of a, what I call the, the cognitive dissonance. So this guy looks like a CSP, but this was on the dual side. So it was the CSP under the holographic transformation went into the Holland, and then and hocus pocus, I got into a CSP type problem again. And then we are going to apply a CSP two, which is kind of CSP like dichotomy criteria on this. And this transformation is specifically to get into like the match gates side, but then these things are not going to satisfy the match gates. And so it eliminates a lot of things, at which point we have five classes remain, and then you can wheel out four of the five, and then you work a little harder, you get the last. So Should I stop here? You can if, you, if, if that's the natural. How, how many minutes do you think I have? Um, two, three. Okay, yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so we've got um, so, the time. So, sorry, go back to this graph. Okay. So, let's just take a two by two matrix entries A, B, C, D. Further back, yeah, it's like very beginning. <laughs> yeah. This is yeah. graph on yeah. So we have A is yeah. a two A two matrix. So Q is two. So we have entries, you know, little A, little, a, little B, little C, little D. Uh, so that would be if B is not equal to C, then there would be a directed graph version because uh, the zero one one zero is equal. Now that's a direct. So if if you were to have the same, it would be the okay. general. So which values of A, B, C, and D are you in which category? <laughs> um, I'm on a one by one. <laughs> uh, you want me to enumerate all of them, or it's infinite? So, uh, but it should be enum Is it enumerable or? Ah, so th there is another. Is there an algebraic condition on A, B, C, and D? Or oh, oh, are you worried about the C being sort of uh, an uncomputable numbers or something? No, no, no. I'm not worried. I'm, perf I'm perfectly at home with complex yeah, numbers. <laughs> <laughs> so I want algebraic numbers. Yeah. Let, let algebraic me be. Algebraic numbers. Yeah. Fine. Uh, so I hand you algebraic numbers. Yeah, yeah. How, how do you tell me which which category it's in? For this particular case of two by two. Yeah. So um, I can I can say that uh, it's you know something like uh, this this is a bipartite, okay, and then uh, you can have uh, a and b and zero zero that will be a generalized equality. So, no, no, you can I, have I one 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 minus you, one. When are you in p and when are you short p hard? Yeah, these are the p. Saying. This is the these are the p. p. Yeah, yeah. And that's it. And, well, there's the rank one also. This, uh, if, if the rank is one. Okay. So it's so in this case, it's pretty simple to enumerate. So we have a four-dimensional space, and <coughs> two-dimensional 
subsets that are in, and then there's isolated points. It's the algebraic variety, yes, but uh, I don't know. Okay. So now, now you're kind of understanding my question. Or at least you're indicating your understanding. <laughs> I think I'm indicating that uh, I understand. No, I understood mean, earlier, just not. Okay. Yeah, let me ask you a question. Yes. So this, uh, I don't know, is there, for instance, a holographic calculation of a determinant? Uh, so of determinant? Yeah. I count, I uh, put, uh, yes, I can... Uh, well, in some sense, the holographic algorithms are the transformations to get into the determinant. So once you get the determinant, it's considered the, the done. Okay. Right. The FKT, the the Fafian algorithm, is a determinant. So. Yes, but uh, assume that uh, is there is still, let's say, uh, something in the term in this simple determinant. Because if you have a matrix with variables, then it's hard. Right. Then it's not so clear. Well, if uh, so, the, the determinant can have exponential number of terms. For instance, if uh, the number of variables is not bounded, but it's uh, it's uh, uh, it's a nice thing to play with. So if uh, if there so uh, would there be some uh, way to let's say to calculate determinant locally with some. Yeah, yeah. So, 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 can you? I mean, so I guess one of the questions would be like, can you d express determinant as a CSP? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I don't know. I don't think so. Yeah. Do nothing. Yeah. I think I was going to ask the same question. So I wanted just a plain determinant general graph, so where does it fit into that picture? It does not fit? Or well, um, the condition is they are not, uh, you have to express as a CSP problem to express this. So I, think I don't know if it can be expressed as a CSP. Probably it cannot be expressed. So the Hamiltonian circuit, for example, cannot be expressed. As yes. So there are things that are not expressible. Okay, I also will get yeah. Outside of this. Right, 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 definitely. Like, for example, the Kirchhoff um, tree matrix is not expressible. This yeah. program is very similar to what you see in this graph limit called H, H model, or, uh, or which is called as well the local global convention. Yeah, yeah, this is, um, I don't have anything useful to say. I think but you, you have main theorem and you have this example, which was the 2 in 2 out. Did you say how the example... Is this is actually in the Holland. So, so this fits into the Holland dichotomy where, in fact, they are a counterexample to this universality. Yeah, so it's technically, it's a Holland problem. So beyond the CSP also. Okay, so... so, so okay, thank you very much.